Welcome. This is Rachel Cooper. I'm the Director of Cultural Diplomacy here at the Asia Society, and this is a global platform to connect across the globe. This is part of our ongoing series during this time of pandemic, where we are really looking at the changes across the globe. Uh, and I'm really delighted today to be welcoming Fatima Bhutto, whose work is so inspiring and uh, who many of you I'm sure know. The Asia Society has had a long relationship with Fatima. Uh, we hosted a book launch with her memoir, Sword, Swords and Blood, back in 2010. And uh, just this past October in 2019, we helped launch New Kings of the World, dispatches from Bollywood, Dizzy, and K-pop uh, with moderator Nermeen Sheikh. Uh, last year, I had a chance to meet her at the Lahore Literary Festival, uh, where she was uh, launching her book, The Runaways, which will be published here in, in August. And uh, she's such an incredible observer of the world. The world has changed so much since that uh, October. It's hard to believe in six months. And, and revisiting these books has really um, just really moved me greatly um, because I read them in a whole new way. So please welcome Fatima Bhutto. Uh, and thank you so much for, for being a part of this ongoing program. Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much for inviting me. So let's start with, I hope that you and your family are, are safe, that you're staying healthy, um, it's a time when, when we're all, I think, reflecting on, on a new world. Uh, you talked about a new, the new kings of that world. Well, it wasn't that world, it's this world. And we're trying to figure out what is this world. But, so I wondered if we could start by just, by just you saying a few things about what it's felt like for you uh, during this time period of, re of reflection and, and introspection. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, yes, I think you're, you're right. It's an entire, it feels certainly like an entirely new world, although perhaps we should have seen some of the signs long before this pandemic. Um, clearly, we know that all these systems um, that have been fated and celebrated for so long are, are broken and, and they're dangerously broken. Um, you know, capitalism is broken, globalization is broken. Uh, I don't think these things can repair in the same way and, and nor really should we want them to. I think we've also seen very clearly at a, at a period in our lives where um, politics, whether you're looking at Europe or you're looking at Asia, or you're looking at America, has been so divisive and, and the world is increasingly electing leaders interested in putting up boundaries and I think one of the things the pandemic has shown us very clearly is that there is no separating any of us. We are all deeply intrinsically connected. Um, our survival is connected um, in, in so many intimate ways, in so many profound ways. And I think this virus has been an important reflection of that. And I think also it has shown us that the, the, the leaders of the world that we see today are not the leaders of the world that we had yesterday. Um, you know, countries that we might have imagined would be at the forefront of fighting this pandemic just aren't. Um, they've kind of absented themselves. Um, and, I, and I think that as things progress, as lockdown continues, and again, I think, of course, we, we have to keep saying it. Those of us who can afford to be locked down at home, who can afford to stay inside, um, are incredibly privileged and lucky. The the real tragedy, as far as I can see, in, in places like South Asia um, may not come from the virus. They may come from hunger, from starvation, from people who are daily wage workers who simply cannot stay home for a day, forget two months. So, so, so much has changed. And, and I think we, would, we ought to be careful not to imagine that we've seen the end of it. I think things will keep changing and dramatically so. Yes, I think it's a big challenge to think about the kind of interdependent world we really do live in. And we, you know, so many of our leaders try to fight that acknowledgement, but I have never mm -hmm. seen 
thing make it so clear as this moment. Absolutely. Uh, you talk about it in some ways in the very beginning of your, your book about uh, popular culture, where you're talking about as the world struggles with the tensions of globalization and the shock waves that are hitting. Well, those shock waves have just turned into tsunamis. Yes. Uh, and we haven't talked about the fact that there are 70 million people, 70 million people who are in some way moving, whether they're migrants or, or refugees. And, and what is, how does that, how do we feel kind of a collective responsibility? Or can we? We haven't done too well so far. No, no, we haven't. And, and, and we absolutely must, I think, you know, that interconnectedness isn't just an abstract sort of multi-culti connectedness. It's a genuine connectedness right. that we, we, right. we, we are not going to survive this if 70 million people um, are endangered. We just can't. No, and the science proves this. This isn't just a made up idea. I mean, I mean, the environment was already telling us this, but the virus in many ways, I mean, the irony of course is, and we'll get back to your, to the idea of popular culture because social media is such a big part of this. Mm -hmm. You know, prior to December, going viral had a whole different meeting. Oh, yes. Yeah, we'll and, never and, use that expression the same way again, I hope. Not so glibly, no, <laughs> I, I agree. Um, so, you know, that's why I was saying going back over the, the, uh, the beginning of the book and sort mm -hmm. of thoughts about this idea of global culture. Yes. After that at one point, maybe 20, 30 years ago, American culture was seen as the, the supreme. Well, no longer. And in a way, it feels like your observations in the book are, are in fact something that can be shared on a, uh, you know, in many different areas in addition to global culture. Yes, absolutely. Um, New Kings of the World is a book that ostensibly looks at global popular culture, but culture isn't born in a vacuum. It's right. born out of many distinct um, interconnections and, and, and um, events. One of those events certainly is migration and urbanization. And I begin uh, New Kings of the World by talking a bit about how as people migrated um, from rural homes into cities, which they did in the hundreds and hundreds of millions, you know, by 2015, a billion people had moved. And contrary to what people in America or Europe might think, uh, the majority of those billion were not moving internationally. They were not moving out of their country into the West, let's say. Uh, I think only about 200, 200 odd million people moved outside of their national borders. But the majority of those billion people on the move, some 700 million people were moving internally and they were going from rural homes into the city. And, and they made those moves because globalization promised uh, all of us actually that a new tide was coming and that new tide was going to bring opportunity, it was gonna bring wealth, it was gonna bring power, it was gonna bring agency, mobility. And globalization promised that it would lift everyone on this wave. And what the majority of those 700 million people found, unfortunately, was of course that that, that just simply wasn't true. And hundreds of millions of people the world over found themselves in cities where they were now disconnected from the ties that had sustained them in, in, in their villages and townships. Um, you know, you can't borrow food in the city. You can't, you know, borrow on credit in the city. Um, nobody knows you in the city. You're a nameless, faceless number. And they had no support. They found themselves deeply unmoored. And I think um, if we look at this, we can talk about it in terms of culture. We can talk about it in terms of anger. We can talk about it in terms of um, a turning towards maybe populist politics. Um, we can see how, how those displaced have been weaponized in many ways. That might be a separate conversation. But in New Kings of the World, I looked at how their tastes were changing and how they began to turn away from American, or at least let's say Western culture, which had reigned supreme until about 20 years ago. It had reigned supreme because it really was aspirational. It was glamorous. Um, it, you know, the stories were stories about 
people with power, whether that power was uh, a monetary power or a political power or a social power, um, there was there was something exciting about it. And um, as this continues, you know, that power starts to look a bit grotesque and it starts to look absent of a lot of things such as ethics and morals. Yeah, it's not something you feel familiar or that, that you can relate to. You know, just to read yeah. one part of your, uh, your introduction, how does one thrive in a modern competitive environment while still retaining traditional values? I mean, I think what you're talking about is, is that these new stories created something that people could relate to in a new way. Yes, absolutely. And so what they what they start to do, I think, is that they start to turn away from Western popular culture and they start to turn towards actually Asian popular culture. So I wrote about Bollywood and I wrote about Turkish television dramas called Dizzy and I wrote about K-pop. And of course, culture moves so quickly that what I wrote about has changed so much yeah. just in the <laughs> you know six months since I was in New York with you and Narmeen. So when I talk about Bollywood, I'm speaking quite specifically about early Bollywood. I'm talking about Bollywood from the 1950s, really up until, I guess, the 1990s, mostly. And what that Bollywood shows um, are, are stories of family, uh, of togetherness, of young men who are trying to live dignified, honorable lives. Um, with the force of the world against them. I mean, that's clearly not what Bollywood is about any longer, though. Um, would you be willing to read a little bit from the book? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to um, read from a digital chapter. So one second, I'm just going to find the right page, which of course I've lost. Okay. Um, what I thought I would read to you from um, is a section in the book uh, in in, um, if I can find it, yes, uh, that takes place in, in Lebanon. And what I did, what I tried to do at least with New Kings of the World is I was not only writing about culture, I was writing about who was consuming that culture. And I traveled to a Syrian refugee camp in Northern Lebanon to write about how a former Ottoman colony um, really became obsessed with Turkish television shows. Um, and I'm going to read to you from that section now. In Akar, two floor fans have been switched on, blowing a gentle breeze of warm air across Sheikh Abdo, the local community leader's makeshift home. For the young and the old, these shows are linked to our past, he explains, drawing an elegant, super slim cigarette out of its pack and lighting it. They are a reminder of what the refugees once had the good fortune to experience before fate brought them here to this converted garbage dump come camp. Family, love, bonds of brotherhood and friendship. Khadija, a mother of seven, clad in a long regal purple kaftan, has been in the Al Ahsan refugee camp for five years. She and her family had left the home she ever knew, Homs, and were shuttled across four cities by the Red Cross before being settled in Arka. Her husband worked in construction in Syria, but was unemployed here, even though there was so much building that needed to be done. Her five sons lived in constant fear of being picked up by the Lebanese army. They don't have the right papers and are illegals. When they try to work, they get caught and arrested. The Lebanese army and police eventually let them go, Khadija said, but it scares the women so much. The men get sick in jail. It's so filthy there, so unhygienic. And the women, they get sick after from mental illness. While we spoke out on the dirt road, a bus with a white decal of Jesus in profile on its back window, wearing a crown of thorns and a tear in his eye drove by. As it ground past the narrow space between the camp and the world, a cloud of dust lifted up from the earth. Jesus save you, the decal said to no one in particular. I watch all the shows, Khadija told me emphatically, pressing her hands on my knees as we sat together on thinly stuffed, misshapen cushions. I watch them for the stories, love, defending love, defending each other. That's what I like. 
Her long hair was tied back into a bun and her face glowed as she spoke about Dizzy. It takes me away from here. I'm living in war. I want to watch romance. Sheikh Abdo must be in his early 40s. He's too young to be called Sheikh, but was given the honorific and appreciation of everything he's done for the displaced in the camp. He inhales deeply from his slender cigarette, running a hand across his white stubble as he does so. Everyone watches the shows here too. There's nothing to do at night except watch TV. This small community of Syrian refugees has been in Lebanon since the start of the Syrian war, Sheikh Abdo says sadly, and they'll stay until there's a solution. The roof over our head is made of thin silvery sheeting and the home is bare except for one luxury item, a fridge, which hums audibly in the corner as we speak. Sheikh Abdo is not exactly a fan of Turkish television programs. He wants to make this very clear to me. All that tension, it's too much. Too much gossip and intrigue and suspense. Who can tolerate two hours of that every single night? He was a teacher and a social worker before the war, and it's purely in this anthropological regard that he might join his fellow exiles in watching an episode or two. In the early days of the war, people were obsessed with the news in the camps. At 4 a.m. sometimes, Sheikh Abdul would walk outside his brick and silver sheet home and see young men, teenagers, kids even, outside on the dirt roads, pacing up and down in the dark scouring their mobile for news of home. They'd tell me so-and-so killed so-and-so. This guy blew himself up. They're 10 years old, but they still knew what was happening in Halab. They knew who was a Shaheed and who was alive, still fighting. Seven years of war have taught the refugees, however, that there's no hope to be found in breaking news. Put on the shows those same boys say now, Sheikh Abdul recounts. Let's remember home. Let's remember Syria. But he doesn't join them, he reminds me. I don't want to watch the shows, he says. It's not home. It's Turkey. That's it. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Um, Thank you. I, I have a couple of questions. I think what I'm going to do is, is filter mm -hmm. questions in because we're going to kind of change when we go to the runaways. Sure, sure. Uh, so, uh, so one question that I've just received is, do you think the pandemic will make people and communities more insular? Um, no, you know, I don't really think it will make us insular because if we judge from our own experiences, I think, you know, we pass every day with news of the world. What are, what's happening in country X, Y, Z? And we you know, obsessively follow numbers and charts and graphs. Um, and these are countries that may not have anything to do with us. These may be faraway countries like Italy or like Iran or like China, because we're, we're, we're tracking something. And that's something we understand to be deeply connected to our own experience. So, so I, I really hope that it won't make us more insular. I think there are concerns we should have. For example, data. How is data going to be misused that's taken for these purposes, like contact tracing and things like that? But, but I, don't, I, I really hope it won't make us more insular. I'm wondering if, um, if you think that we will continue to have a more global uh, culture. Uh, someone has asked if you see China's culture coming into this, but I think what does it mean to to be global and is there a way that that's a more interdependent um, understanding than mm. that we have right now, which is so consumer based? Yeah, well, I, I you know, I, I wrote in New Kings of the World that I wasn't able to talk about China except as a shadow because China is its own book. But if we're just talking about culture, it's, it's quite clear that China is going to trump quite a lot of the people I wrote about in New Kings of the World. Um, you know, and China had, um, had, had, had put cultural production as, as one of their aims um, in their five-year plans many, many years ago. And I do think we will look very much towards China um, if we're talking about the pandemic too. I think it's, um, 
I, it was just recently, maybe a day ago, that I read that there are more Chinese companies testing their vaccines on humans already than companies in the United States and the United Kingdom combined. So I, I think China is certainly going to be an, a leader of, of our new world. Um, I think there'll be others too. I, I do think that the, the sun has sort of set um, on, on the West in, in, in a certain way. Um, and I think that's true when we talk about culture and I think it's true when we talk about their influence in the world as well. I mean, I realize that we still talk in terms of the East and the West um, it's starting to feel a little dated to me, and I'm yeah. just thinking about about what that might mean going forward. And and along with that, I'm wondering what observations you said. Many of the things you wrote about six months ago or talked about six months ago, in fact, either you see in a different way or there are new things arriving. So I'm wondering if you could, if you could share a little bit of that. Absolutely. And I think that's part of hegemony, isn't it? Is that um, the West is this, you know, um, monolith and the, all the rest of us are the East <laughs> or right, the global right. South, <laughs> you know, and where, you know, more than half the world's population, we don't even get to be a distinct uh, block. But I think a lot of that should change. I think it's quite time that it changes. You know, I always thought the way in which we classify is so redolent of power. You know, why is it Judeo-Christian religions. Um, Islam has exactly the same monotheistic qualities um, that the other two have. So I think a lot of the naming um, that we've relied on will have to adjust, as do a lot of our, our, our assumed ideas and, and things that we were unwilling to question. You know, I think a lot of the media has just presented globalization to us in the last 20 years as an overall good. It, it was never spoken about as something that might contain within it some danger. And of course, we see the results of that danger now. Um, but there wasn't a whole lot of discussion about those left behind, about those many hundred million that weren't carried along with globalization. Um, sorry, you were about to say something. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and the legacy of colonialism. And the legacy of... We have this conversation if that history is not really brought forward it's so, it's so um yes it's, it's a legacy of, of of so many so many fragile things that have presented to us as um sorry this is a new the, the new normal isn't it you're gonna have to okay, let that it's, it's, a, it's the soundtrack <laughs> um but it it, it is interesting. I think we also have to think about other things. You know, when we talk about um, a, a vaccine, how is this vaccine going to be made available to, to the poor? Um, is this going to be a vaccine that you, can you only live if you can afford to? Does a, a zip code or an area code determine whether people live or die in this new world? I think so much has to be broken down and, and rethought of, reimagined at least, before it's rebuilt. So I've got a couple more questions, and they both have to do with uh, Pakistan and, in fact, sin, and mm -hmm. whether, whether uh, you have thought about writing about that and kind of the some of the uh, wisdom or mm -hmm. or in, at least knowledge we might gain from from that. Mm -hmm. uh, perspective. Well, I did. I wrote um, songs of blood and sword. Um, is, is a book about Pakistan and, and sin factors very much into that book. Um, it begins and ends in sin and, and a lot of it is told through sin. Um, Shadow of the Crescent Moon, the first novel that I published, um, is also a book set in Pakistan. It's set in northern Pakistan. And um, The Runaways too is set in Pakistan. So Really, it's only New Kings of the World. And actually, I hasten to add that New Kings of the World begins in Peshawar. And yeah. I, I, I wrote about Pakistani television uh, serials. Um, you know, Pakistan had a very vibrant um, arts culture. It has a very vibrant arts culture. But in the 1980s, uh, the Pakistani cultural scene was uh, vital in, in fighting dictatorship. Um, playwrights, poets, uh, singers, musicians, all resisted General Zeul Haq's brutal dictatorship. And uh, he was, of course, a CIA dictator. Uh, he was charged with fighting the first Afghan war on behalf of um, America and England. 
um, to stop communism. And um, Pakistan's history uh, of resistance is, is a brave one and a large one. So Pakistan always does figure into my work, whatever it is I'm writing about, whether it's culture or it's fiction. Um, and, you know, just if we're talking about uh, recent days, you know, what, I, what I've what i seen in Pakistan is just a tremendous amount of coming together, um, whether we're talking about doctors um, who are just doing incredible work. Uh, I spoke yesterday to um, a doctor friend of mine in, in Larkana. Um, and it's 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 young women like that doctor who are at the front lines uh, of trying to stop this um at the same time people know and i think we understand very very clearly in countries like pakistan that we we cannot isolate ourselves from the world we know that we cannot isolate ourselves from two streets away or from the people we live with we we sink or swim together and and um I wish there was better news to share, but I think we're all in a sort of tense uh, moment right now. We're in a tense moment, but hopefully it's also a time when we're really reflecting. Yes. And, and you have to question everything, I think. Absolutely. You know, when we're so often rushing here and there and, and uh, to meet deadlines and to get to the airport, to have some moment where it's required that we reflect. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we, we had, we saw some, I mean, there was some odd news maybe um, about a month ago where um, we saw cricket players. And again, this goes back to culture and, and, and how important culture is. Cricket players across the border, cricket players in India were encouraging people to help um, Pakistani yeah. cricket players to raise money for their foundations. And some of those players were attacked and told how, you know, this is anti-national this idea is so ridiculous when we're fighting a virus. You know, what kind of a concept is anti-national? It doesn't exist um, when there's a pandemic at hand. Yes, the answer is, uh, I mean, it's so interesting being here in New York where it's our governor and mayor who seem to be leaders in, in as opposed to uh, some of our national leaders. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that, and you know, that's that whole idea of the local versus the, the global, or what is that term, global? Yes, that's right. You talked about that with the K-pop. That's so interesting. I wonder oh, yeah. if we shift to the runways, runaways. Yeah. I think it's, it's both about K-pop, but it's also about that idea of taking something and making it local. Well, in the K-pop um, context, globalization is a very particularly Korean concept. And the way in which they use it, as you said, the larger idea, of course, is to take something global and turn it into something local. They, they do a bit of, I don't know if it's the reverse or, but what right. they essentially do is they take global pop music, pop tempos that you're, we're all familiar with, and they localize it um, by, by Koreanizing it. And, and what that means is that they speed it up. And it's that escalated speed that makes K-pop so catchy and so dancey um, and so infectious. Uh, but essentially, it's pretty much the same music you already know. <laughs> um, I'm going to share one more question and then we can talk to about the runways. Uh, runways. I keep saying runways instead of runways. <laughs> Um, and this, this question uh, comes from Aisha Ahmed. Uh, Western societies are perhaps more fearful of the pandemic than some in the East. Do you think our culture and belief systems have something to do with that? Well, I think it's about the fact that we, we might have very divided societies in some sense, but we don't live in silos. Right. So you cannot just live in a good neighborhood and go to a good school and cut yourself off from how the rest of your country might be living, which I think you can do to some degree in the West. You know, you, you might make a certain living and then live in a gated community and that's where you live. That's where your kids go. But in, in countries like Pakistan, um, there's no cutting yourself off from a, a raging inequality, from a, a very brutal poverty, um, from, from the total unfairness of the system and also the brokenness of the system. And so I think in places like Pakistan, we know that we cannot rely on big institutions. We know that we have to rely on each other. So people help each other. 
um, people feed each other, people care for each other, you know, um, people watch out for each other. And I think that's something that certainly does help, you know, the, the numbers of the virus in places like Pakistan and India, as far as I can tell, are, are not as high as, as we would think they would be given the amount of people, the density of people. Um, I, nobody really knows why that is. But there's certainly a lot more movement between places um, coming together to help. There's an incredible animal charity in, in Karachi, my hometown, called the um, ACF Animal Rescue. Um, and they're just dealing with, you know, abused and abandoned animals. And yet they've got in, entire teams operating in, in dire conditions. And they're doing it well and, and, and really impressively. So one more observation since I'm here in New York, uh, the idea that I, I think the, the downside to this sort of uh, global media is that it, it places everyone in these two-dimensional perspectives. Mm -hmm. So the idea that, that uh, at least people in my city aren't absolutely coming together as a community, mm -hmm. working together, taking care of their... Mm -hmm. their um, the people who are disenfranchised really mm -hmm. think about that. So what I notice is that there's a kind of community building that's happening across the globe. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily make the headlines. That's you know, right. If it, if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't lead. Yeah. I'm sorry. There's a lot of more positive things happening. And I think it's really important that yeah. we find a way to, I don't know, maybe see each other in, in, uh, in perspective. Absolutely. I think we, I think we need those stories. They're, they're not soft stories. They're vital stories yeah. because we need to yeah. know that people survive. We need to know that they can do it with a degree of kindness and compassion. Yeah. Um, you know, I think people were very moved by those stories that came out of Italy of people standing on balconies and singing to each other. And yeah. I would have loved to see more stories of that coming out of Iran, let's say, you know, but yeah, absolutely. But it's, it's not the right story for Iran because, you know, the Iran story always has to be a little um, grittier and more frightening. Um, I'd love to see more stories. Al Jazeera of that sometimes gets us there. They do sometimes. I think there's also, Rachel, one other important thing to keep in mind. You know, we're so heavily reliant on information right now. Um, as you mentioned earlier, we're looking at social media, we're checking our Twitter, we're looking at the news, and we've become right. obsessed with information. And I think one of the dangerous things I've seen, at least, is that we are also seeing the blowback of, um, you know, just unchecked information, you know, all those yeah. WhatsApp forwards with the conspiracy theories, the way in which the virus is being used to demonize communities, the way in which um, people are you know, running off with their own, you know, oh, if you eat X, Y, Z, you'll be immune, or if you drink bleach or things like that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's dangerous too, information. And, and, you know, no time like the well, present for a yeah, reminder of that. Information and, and rumor. And so maybe this is the moment to, to switch to the run, runaways. Yes. Runaways, oh, which hi. actually had me in tears this morning. Um, oh really in tears it's because i think it really has the kind of humanizing quality yeah that we're talking about and, and i have to say and i don't know if you meant this or not but there was something that felt like a sufi parable i couldn't help but thinking of leila and majnun yeah and I was thinking of leila and monty i did mean it yeah okay <laughs> i did okay. um I did. Uh, it was, it's, it's so, it's so moving. Uh, could you give us a little, a little bit about that book? Um, I'm, sure. I'm so thrilled that it's going to be coming out here. It's so important. Yes. Um, I'm really thrilled too. And I sort of yelped because I hadn't seen the American version of the book um, until you held it up to the screen. So the runaways, um, which is out in India and Pakistan already. It's out in the United Kingdom in paperback just now, and it comes out in the US in August, is the story of young people driven to um, radicalism. And it takes place between Pakistan, between Portsmouth in England, um, and between Iraq. And the question it asks essentially is, what would it take to drive a young person who 
has a family, has a community, has a place in the world, what would it take to take that person and put them at arms against their society? And I'm glad you caught um, Leila and Majnoon. Um, I actually wanted to do, I wanted to name a character Leila for another book, uh, well, an idea I had for another book. Um, and it didn't work out, but I, I like the idea of someone being driven mad um, yeah. by, by a woman mad enough to do terrible, terrible things. And the, the, the heart of the runaways to me is that it isn't religion that drives people to radicalization. You know, we spent 20 years talking about extremism, talking about terrorism. And the, the, the short answer to what any of that has anything to do with is always presented as religion. It's always presented specifically as a religion. And I think if you live in the Muslim world, if you live in the global South, then you know that religion actually isn't a driver to radicalization. It's, it's things like anger, it's humiliation, it's alienation, it's being wounded. It's not being wounded. seen. Not being seen, yes, exactly. It's, it's, you know, it's the feeling of not having a voice in your society. And if you are not seen in your society, you don't feel you have the opportunity to a, um, a noble future in your society, then you're going to be incredibly vulnerable to anyone who offers you a voice, who offers you a, a way of being seen, um, and who offers you a part of their vision, you'll take it. And you'll especially take it, I think, if you're 20 years old um, and young and confused. Could you uh, read a little bit from the book? Yes, I've got the, the UK paperback, which looks like the American one, just in green. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I'm going to read to you from a section um, from Sunny. And Sunny is a young man whose father migrates from Lucknow um, to the United Kingdom. And Sunny is born in England, but, but finds himself increasingly outside what he had just naturally considered his home. Sunny spent hours on Instagram, scrolling through strangers' lives looking at photo after photo until his eyes ached from the dull light of photoshopped colors. He shopped for cheap designer gear on eBay, looking for brands of sweaters and kicks that his favorite rappers wore. But it was on YouTube one night that Sunny came across a video of Muhammad Ali. Sitting on a stage in front of thousands of people, the boxer, formerly known as Cassius Clay, spoke of his Muslim faith. All the angels in the Christian religion are white, Ali said of his Baptist past. Why come we never get to go to heaven? Why come Mexicans never get to go to heaven? Ali, in his elegant blue blazer and black turtleneck, spoke of being turned away from white churches, but finding love everywhere in Islam. You say assalamu alaikum and you've got a home, you've got a brother anywhere in the world. He was never good enough, the boxer said, but in Islam, he was always striving to change, to be better. From there, Sunny discovered Malcolm X, another strong man persecuted and put down, finding the light of solidarity only in Islam. And it was then that Sunny began to devote himself full time to looking at the heritage of his people, educating himself on the struggle and the centuries of battles fought over people's souls. He spent hours Googling Arabic translations, reading blog posts about jurisprudence, collating and collecting fables and histories. And then he shared his learning, waiting hopefully for someone to appreciate all his proud knowledge and analysis. But nobody responded to Sunny's posts. One day, a stranger liked his offering on gambling. There it was, a thumbs up. The first validation of his investigations but when Sonny logged back onto his Facebook page later that afternoon, the like was gone. What had he done? Why had someone bothered to go back, find his post and unlike it? Sonny linked his Facebook to his Twitter account, thinking that he would receive greater traction in a universe built on trading information. But everything Sonny tweeted landed soundlessly as if he had not written anything at all. He waited patiently, sitting at his old lady's desk, his knees bent up against the wood until his skin went red and his legs cramped. 
listening to Channel Orange on repeat, feeling personally, acutely, like a diamond in a rocky, rocky world. It felt like all his life Sonny had been waiting until the moment when someone would see him, when someone would know him, would meet him at the intersection of his confusion and emptiness, and in seeing him, would lift him from his troubled self. I'll stop there. You know, it's such a, um, it's, it's so personal. Each of the characters, as you travel with them on their journey to try to find themselves and, and sometimes finding themselves in a situation that they themselves cannot get, yeah. didn't really mean to get into. Yeah. Um, but it's, but it's that humanizing side that I found so deeply moving in the book. And I'm just wondering how you came to write this, how you came to think this is a story I need to tell. Well, I suppose it was always a story that was bubbling up and that it crystallized in some kind of hurt. And, you know, living in a post 9-11 world, I was a college student in, in New York when 9-11 happened. Um, I was doing my master's in London uh, at SOAS when 7-7 happened. You know, I grew up in Syria. Um, I was born in Kabul in Afghanistan, I'm from Pakistan. And, and over the last 20 years, I mean, from really my adult life, from when I was 19 years old um, till now, it, it, it felt very much that the world was at war with my part of the world, um, with places I loved and with places that I knew that had somehow become distorted and made monstrous. And in, in, in that, I too had become monstrous and and it was a lot of woundedness really that drove me to start thinking about the things that made it into the runaways it was that feeling at airports you know the moment you hand over your green passport and and the agent sees where you're from and the way in which you feel humiliated um that that just kind of scratched away at me until gosh i guess now it's about six years ago in 2000. 14-ish, just when ISIS had kind of broken out onto the world in, in all their terrifying um, high definition way, that a, a friend said to me, you know, you should, you should write about that. Why don't you think about doing your next novel about this? And for a second, I thought, God, that's, that's a crazy idea. Who, who would want to read that? And actually, I wanted to read that. I wanted to read something that wasn't about um, the one dimensionality of the idea that just says, oh, well, people from this place become terrorists or, or you, know, you know, violence is only done in, in this way. And, and so I spent about four years thinking about it and, and, and really writing The Runaways and <laughs> rewriting and rewriting The Runaways. Um, and again, it was a book that I was writing in a, in a way kind of similar to New Kings and in a way kind of not that was being written at the same time as things were being lived in a, in a, in a parallel way in the news. And you always had to try and stay one step ahead of the news until I realized actually you didn't because the story that mattered was that internal story. It was that intimate story and that's never told on the news. Was there a process of researching the book? I'm curious about, you know, what part of this was imagined and what part of this was you really delving into these stories? Yeah, well, I, I did do quite a bit of research and it was a lot of deep diving on the internet, actually. And when I started writing The Runaways in 2014, um, they hadn't scrubbed all that stuff off of Twitter and Reddit and Tumblr. Um, and so I, I had access to these strange things. You'd have these young boys that would go out. There was um, a Dutch, a, a, a former soldier in the Royal Netherlands Army, um, you know, a, a Dutch kid, essentially, who spoke Dutch, was born in, in the Netherlands and left. And he, he ran away to Syria to join ISIS. And uh, he spoke English, he spoke, Dutch. I mean, he was a very sort of eloquent young boy. And he would do these AMAs, you know, ask me anything. And it was this absurd, um, yet familiar process, you know, 
children of the internet are used to AMAs and we're used to the kind of live, you know, tweeting and all that. Right. And I read through a lot of these things. Imagine that it would be about violence, that these would be AMAs about terror and about, and they weren't really, they were about, do you feel lonely out there? You know, and the answer was no, I've got, I'm part of a huge community. And you could see the very seductive nature of the propaganda. And the propaganda, of course, of extremism is not come and join us, we'll go murder a bunch of people together. The seduction is in saying, no, I felt alone before, but now people accept me and I'm powerful and I have influence. And I now not only am not alone, but I control swaths of territory. I control people. I control. And for young men, especially, you know, I think young men grappling with, well, the heaviness of what masculinity means, what power means. I think that's very appealing, unfortunately. So I have a, a question from, from online asking, uh, of the characters in The Runaways, is there one you resonate with more than others? Yes, well, you know, it, it usually changes their periods when you're writing where you like someone more than someone else. And of course, they're supposed to be like your children, you're supposed to love them equally, I guess. But, <laughs> but, um, but Sunny was always my favorite, actually. I, I always loved Sunny, even though, uh, and not to give away any spoilers, but Sunny is one of the characters who really faces terrible, terrible choices. And I loved him in spite of that, um, because he had so much to lose. And, um, and at other points, I, I, I was very attached to Layla, but, but mainly Sunny. Sunny really struggles. And he really struggles. He gets beyond the, I don't need to struggle anymore. Well, I think that's the thing. You know, I think we saw this again, if we want to turn back to the news for a second, when, if we look back to last, just last year, you know, there were cases of people trying to return home. There was um, a young woman from Alabama, I think it was, uh, who, if I'm not mistaken, um, was was of Somali origin and she'd run away from a home in, in Alabama to go and live out in Syria, who was then doing interviews on CBS saying, I, I want to, I've changed my mind. I'd like to come home. And, you know, they're, they're quite fascinating to watch those interviews. Um, that young woman in Alabama, when she was asked why she ran away to join a terrorist organization, she said, you know, I, I, I grew up in an incredibly strict home. My parents are very strict. They didn't let me go to sleepovers. I couldn't just be a normal American kid, which of course is what she was or what she thought she was. And she said, I ran away to be free. You know, and I, I, that's so counterintuitive to us. And I think that's part of what I was interested in writing about in, in the novel is exploring the idea at which pain at some point becomes too large to be soothed. And you, you, you re react to it um, by just breaking it in, in incredibly destructive ways. So these are all really young people. Yeah. And at some point, and given the story you just told, mm -hmm. this of redemption, mm -hmm. of, of change, mm -hmm. um, in many ways, our society has not allowed for that. It's like, no, yeah. you're guilty and you're guilty forever. Mm -hmm. There's no redemption. So I'm just wondering your thoughts about that idea of, especially given these are very young people, you know, early 20s at, at most. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, you know, as a, as a, personally, I, I, I believe in redemption. I think redemption should be afforded to everyone. But I think if we look again in, at the real cases, um, in the case of this young woman from Alabama, she did, she did terrible things and she was an inciter to violence. So part of her role when she went to Syria was to incite people to join and to commit acts of, of terror. That's a terrible right. thing. But, but in, say, in her country saying to her, you can't come back, I think they absolve themselves of a responsibility that's partly theirs because this young woman is, is born in a country. She's educated by that country. She's a product of their school systems. Um, and I think it says something about the duty a, a country, a community has towards each other. Um, a, first of all, you should want to debrief her, number one. You should want to know how did somebody get 
how did happen? she get there? How was she groomed? Who groomed her? What's the process? That's intelligence you should certainly be interested in. And, you know, the same thing was seen with the case of um, Shamima Begum in, in England, um, who was another young woman who was 15 years old from Bangladeshi background, uh, who, unlike uh, Huda Muthana, the young woman from Alabama, Shamima Begum didn't commit violence as far as we know. Um, she, she just went out there and she got married and um, in fact lost all of her children. Three of her children died before the age of two. But at no point did her country say, we have a responsibility not just to try you for any crimes you've committed, but presumably to rehabilitate you, to try and understand what went wrong and to make sure no other young people are vulnerable um, to this this level of, of uh, grooming and influence again. I mean, that is a social dilemma that we have that has gotten bigger and bigger, particularly in, in this country, but this idea of accountability, mm -hmm. responsibility, and, mm -hmm. and is, is there, you know, the possibility of redemption or, mm -hmm. or at least asking for forgiveness? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that's, and that's built into those stories is maybe it's in the sequel. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's interesting that you say that it's, you know, if we look again at France, you know, and France struggled quite a lot with people running away to go and join things like um, radical groups in Syria and Iraq. And um, again, you have to remember that they don't just get up one morning and go off and join, you know, a terrible band of misfits. These are boys who lived in the banlieue, who lived in the circle of misery that surrounds the capital. You know, they, they're in not just slums, but they're in outer slums. And there's no, they have no access into the city. They have no access into the world of finance and, you know, university systems and training. Um, they, they're really relegated to the periphery, the periphery of opportunity, the periphery of um, wealth, the, the periphery of really visibility of being seen. And, and, and these are, you know, they, they did, they found, that there's so much in, interesting information. I mean, one of the, um, one of the interesting things that, that I uh, discovered in the process of working on this book is the fact that um, most of the recruits who joined groups like ISIS, um, you know, they were kind of tested when they joined. They were made to do little tests and things. And of course, they kept all the results, which eventually were uncovered by journalists. And um, I think it's it's something like more than half of the recruits or something, 70 percent, had a below average understanding of religion. I mean, so these are not people joining because they heard a great religious um, verse or something, you know, who or who believe so strongly that they are killing for their beliefs. These are really people who are angry and, and alone and abused. And um, they, were, they were offered something that they didn't find at home, so they took it. I mean, I can't help but think at this time when religion offers, can offer something, and yet it's often um, interpreted in very didactic ways that are prescriptive mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. Um, sort of the big messages when I, mm -hmm. when I think of, of Islam or Buddhism mm -hmm. or Hinduism or mm -hmm. Christianity or indigenous beliefs. So many of them have some idea that we are, we are intrinsically connected to each other. Yes. I mean, that's, that's, that's very powerful. And yet so many of the of the interpretations can be so much narrower. Uh, absolutely, Rachel. And also, I mean, if we think about it, no religion, no religious system of ideas is about power. Right. If any religion you want to look at is, is ultimately about submission. It's ultimately about surrender. Now, right. what you are surrendering or submitting to, of course, there's a lot of fine print, but but I've, I've yet to come across a religion that, that glorifies influence and power um the very much the opposite but of course you know the the manipulation of information started long before the internet age i think we forget that sometimes when we get angry at things like twitter and fake whatsapp forwards well uh, again it's a, it's a time of introspection so it's a time where rather than just being reactive we can be 
responsive and thoughtful and, and perhaps curious, maybe mm -hmm. the, at the heart of our humanity. Um, I just want to thank you for this great conversation and congratulate you on both books. But I'm, I'm very excited that The Runaways. Ah, uh, how nice to see it. <laughs> will be, will be, um, will be published here in the U.S. in, in August through Verso Books. Um, I, I do want to say that, the, as you know, the Asia Society has been offering a lot of content online mm -hmm. for free. Uh, and we hope you, uh, the audience, have enjoyed these programs. Uh, we hope you'll consider giving a gift of any size to support our work. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can donate by checking out the link in the video description. Uh, I also want to mention that we have a program tomorrow at 1 o'clock New York time on North Korea. How is COVID-19 affecting North Korea? Um, but really, I want to thank you, Fatima, for taking the time to share so much. And this is, uh, I, I think, a really important conversation. And your two books are two sides of an important global perspective. I mean, I'm really pleased that we could talk about both of them because I think they were both really important. And particularly to talk about them now because I think I know I read them in a different way and I, I hope our audiences will, will check out both these books. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. It was so nice to speak to you and I hope very much to come back with The Runaways for something yes, at Asia we can Society. Do, uh, we can, we can uh, do some other programming. I'm looking forward to having you back. If not, well, we hope on our stage. Here <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, the stage changes, so, so I'm flexible. Right. But I do really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you.